This Week in Science and Education is brought to you in part by the University of Western Ontario, www.uwo.ca. We thank them for their support. This Week in Science and Education is also brought to you by Laurentian University. Check out Laurentian at laurentian.ca. We thank them for their support. Hey everybody, it's time for This Week in Science and Education. This is episode 53, recorded Thursday, October 27, 2011, Drugs and Rats. Hey everybody, thanks a lot for taking the time to join us on This Week in Science and Education. This is your host, Kevin Kugler. Joining me as always, Colin Jago, Kawartha Pine Ridge. Colin! (laughs) Jeez, I feel like I should be running down the aisle at the Price is Right. And as always, Dr. Thomas Merritt. Thomas, wake up! Here we are. How are you? Good. Gentlemen, nice to see you. Good to see you. Uh, Beside you is our special guest today. This is Dr. James Watterson. He is from Laurentian University. Drugs and Rats is the name of the show. Can't wait to find out how that relates to forensic toxicology. Dr. Watterson, thank you for taking the time to join us today on the show. We appreciate it. Let's start right off by asking you a couple questions. Maybe you could explain to us a little bit about the nature of your research at Laurentian. Uh, well, I'm a forensic toxicologist, and uh, what we uh, normally what a forensic toxicologist does is they uh, collect samples from cases, so death investigations, impairment cases, things like that. Uh, samples being blood, urine, uh, sometimes saliva, hair, uh, and they look for the presence of drugs or alcohol or other toxins and help them in order to help get some information about the case. So if it's a death investigation, whether or not the toxicity was fatal. <laughs> Uh, if it's an impairment case, whether or not somebody was impaired, say, with respect to the ability to drive, that sort of thing. Uh, and my area of research is looking, uh, using bone tissue um, from the cases where you have a skeletonized body left over uh, and trying to ascertain what you can get out of using bone tissue because it's a fairly novel, not very often used thing. Hmm. So let's pretend that I'm a uh, 10-year-old watching this podcast or listening. How would you describe a day in the life of Dr. James Watterson? What exactly do you do in the lab? Uh, In the lab, basically what we do is we use uh, uh, experimental animals. Uh, So we use rats. And the rats are given uh, a drug of interest. And uh, after that, we'll study various conditions, things like, you know, how long after they get the drug, uh, and the drug is allowed to move through the body and then broken down. And you, after the animal uh, passes, um, you recover some bone tissue. Can you actually detect any drug inside that bone? And then can you detect any other markers that have any, give you any information about when the drug may have been used, how much might have been used, so on and so forth. Whether or not that amount of drug could have uh, helped contribute to the death. So one of the things just that... So James, literally his office is is the other side of the hallway that that I work on. Um, And we started running into each other, um, I guess about the time we both, we got here, we got here about the same time. Um, And talking to James about his research, one of the things that that struck me was that, you know, we we all watch the the forensic biology shows and, you know, the CSIs, and and they all magically come up with these these answers. But we know surprisingly little about the stuff (laughs) that they're making up on these shows, right? And and the thing that James does is actually the, the basic research that would allow you to answer these questions. So, you know, if, if at a crime scene what you have left is a skeleton and you think that drugs were involved, then it seems like you should be able to test that skeleton and, and find out if drugs were involved. And we know surprisingly little about yeah. what happens to drugs through time. And oftentimes the only thing that is left at a crime scene is a skeleton. So James has got a bunch of drugged up pigs or a bunch of drugged up rats, and they put them out in somebody's farm or they put them in a fume hood and let the the body decompose, and then he takes a bone sample and looks for these drug metabolites. So he's actually doing the basic science that makes these you know neat TV shows seem so neat um, because we really don't know these questions. And so it's but it's interesting how little we do know. Um, do we know more or less about different compounds, different drugs? I mean, is this a matter of us catching up with new drugs, or is it just we don't know that much we, about metabolism? It's a matter of, uh, of catching up with uh, 20 years ago with, the, with what was done in blood. What's now, which is routinely okay. done in blood, um, most forensic labs don't even know how to deal with bone. So they call me. Uh, I've gotten phone calls from, from a European police agency saying, is it worthwhile to exhume a body? We've got new evidence to say... 
to think that maybe this person may have been poisoned. Um, but they've been buried for 10 years. Should we go to the trouble and the trauma on the family of exhuming the body? And right now I have to say I don't know. So why don't we know? Why, why is blood so much easier than bone, or is it just that we were working on blood? Uh, blood is easier than bone because it's a liquid. And so, A, there's lots of it around. It's, it's, um, the reason that they use blood is because uh, physiologically, um, you know, the reason we have blood is because blood carries oxygen, nutrients, and all that sort of thing. So there are different cells and different tissues in the body. Um, and so because it carries those things there, uh, it's, it's the best indicator of toxicity. Right? It's not perfect, but it's the best thing to correlate toxic effect with a level of drug, a concentration of drug in a blood sample. Um, the difficulty with working with bone comes from, there's the technical difficulty that comes from the fact that it's a solid tissue. You can't put on a vortex, or you can't mix it up, you can't add things to it and stuff like that. Um, the other difficulty is actually a, a legal complication in that um, the laws of most jurisdictions in North America We'll not allow you to, to do research on autopsy tissues. Hmm. Um, so you cannot, I can't go to the, pet, to the office of the chief coroner and say, can I scoop some bone tissue off of your autopsies? And they say, yeah, yeah, sure, sure, go ahead. But you can't do that with blood. I can't, no, I, they, they can take blood. They can't even collect tissue at autopsy unless it can be used to establish cause of death. Okay. Right? And because nobody knows, it's, and then it becomes a very circular problem because <laughs> you have, you don't, if the yeah. bone tissue is the only thing that you have left and hoping to try and find out if it causes death, but you're not allowed to collect it, then there's no way you'll ever learn how Whether to you use can. it. Yeah. And so the problem never ends up going away. Right. And so our approach has been start off with a small animal model, start off with rats, prove that we can do it, prove it with all sorts of different drugs, prove it with all of the peculiarities that exist with blood things like drugs that break down, like cocaine, for example, spontaneously breaks down in your blood. Um, does it do the same thing in bone? Right. Uh, and there's other <coughs> things that break down under conditions of decomposition. So there's a certain drug called clonazepam that as your blood decomposes, it will decompose too through microbial activity. Mm -hmm. Does the same thing happen in, in bone tissue? And that's the phase that we're at now is A, can we just figure out good methods for analyzing it? Uh, B, what does it mean if you, what does it mean if you detect a drug in bone? Does it mean that it was there and the person was under the influence of that drug at the time of death? Or does this stuff soaked up and yeah. stored? Up so they were on the previous? drug weeks, weeks ahead of time. Exactly. And so we're just starting to answer some of those basic questions now. And so that, that was the interesting talking to James is that, you know, you watch these TV shows and, and you know, it's like reading a textbook. You, you read a textbook in class and you think, okay, well, this is the way it is. And, and you watch the CSI investigators and like, oh, well, obviously, we're just going to send this off for a test and, you know, blah, 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 blah. But yeah, we get it we back in 10 seconds. The science. Yeah, and I'll have it back in 10 seconds. Oh, exactly. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> but so, you know, it's interesting to talk to James about how this science is actually done um, and how little we do know, and, you know, whether it's bone or any other tissue. Um, so, you know, when you talk as a teacher, when you talk to your students, when you're presenting material, um, you're often stuck presenting it as this is what the textbook says. Um, but if you can always take a step back and say, this is how we've actually generated that information. Mm -hmm. um, so an interesting thing talking to James is, you know, we'd like to know about this drug metabolism in bones, because oftentimes that's all you've got to work with. But there are all these complications and things like we hadn't talked about this, the legal issues of if, if all you're going to have is bone, can you get to that bone to even do the, the basic science to find out whether you could determine that it, it was actually, yeah. uh, you know, that it would give you an idea of the, the cause of death. You're, you're caught in this, this do loop. Because we, can, we can't get the samples, we can't find out whether the samples would give us the information that would allow us to get the samples. And eventually your head explodes. And it's amazing because the, um, the cases where it comes up, where they need it, are the really, really dramatic ones. Yeah. So there was, you guys, you wouldn't, might not have heard of this one, but the, the group in, in London, is it, where are you guys, London? And London and Peterborough. Other, the other group. London and Peterborough. So you would remember in 2000, and, I guess 2005, 2006, there was a, a girl from Toronto who was named Cecilia Jean. Does this ring a bell? She was abducted yes, from her house. Yeah. That particular case, uh, all that was recovered from that case were skeletal remains. And I was at the forensic lab in Toronto at the time, and basically we were standing there going, we don't know what to do with it. We can't really do anything with it because nobody knows what it means. If you find something, does that mean it was there? Or if you don't find anything, does that mean that nothing was there? Yeah. And those, that is probably the most basic level of understanding. And they didn't even know that very well back then. And we're getting, we're chipping away at it, but it, it needs controlled experiments. And you have to do those on animals right now.
Yeah. So that, that's what, you know, the, when you think about how this, the information is being used, Ultimately, we'd like to be able to follow this drug metabolism in, in human remains from a, a forensic point of view, from a you know, crime-solving or cause-of-death-solving point of view. But James's work is, is on, well, when I first met you, I think you were working on pigs. I've, we've had one pig so far, Betty. Uh, we didn't really name it, but, but don't <laughs> Betty. Don't and name the pig. We're trying to get more because we actually got, it was a gift. <laughs> it was a Christmas gift from a colleague of mine in the States. <laughs> who found out what we were doing with rats, and he tried to do it with some experiments with some pigs, and uh, he just left a bunch of pigs that had been exposed out in the field. So they're still probably sitting in a farmland somewhere in Ohio. <laughs> but, so, you know, the basic science is you, you take these model systems, whereas I'm using fruit flies in the lab, and James is using rats, mm. um, and we're, we're doing the very basic science to try to figure out how, do this, how does the biological system work? What can we find? What can't we find in these samples? Uh, with, in this case, the ultimate goal of, of applying it to forensic sciences. So it, it's a much more applied science. But hmm. we're both funded through the same Natural Sciences and Engineering Research Council. So it's all basic science. It's just very different aspects of that basic science. So I've got to, I want to give Colin a little chance to jump in here, but Colin, I've got a question for you first. Um, sure. you know, just talking about forensics and CSI, have you noticed an increase in interest in forensics since that program came out in, uh, in the high schools? Um, and at what point does forensics enter in the curriculum, if it does at all? Um, and I bet, I bet James can speak to, to the increase in interest as well. Uh, but from a high school point of view, the kids are interested in it and they all want to do it. It's one of those things that's, it's, you know, because it's on TV and it looks really cool and snazzy and they get to drive around in big cars, they all want to do it. But, but that's been really interesting because it's driven an interest in science. And so there has been nothing in, in the curriculum specifically, but a lot of high schools in Ontario have put together like multidisciplinary courses where they're putting together one or two different kinds of courses, a chemistry with the biology maybe, and sort of wrapping the forensic idea around it and, and getting kids into science that way. And I know for a fact there's a number of university programs that have started forensic programs that really sort of paralleled the rise of this of this interest in TV as well. And Trent University here in Peterborough has a forensics program that's uh, that's less than 10 years old, if I understand it, if I remember correctly. So it's it's really driven an interest. Um, and I, just James is very interesting thinking about the basic science and how little we actually know. Like I didn't really I didn't really know that. <laughs> like and it's really fascinating to think that we're still at the at the point where we're trying to figure out. Like you mentioned cocaine as an example. So you know does long term cocaine use show up in bones after the bones have been buried for 20 years in a field or something like that? And, and I'm guessing that we don't know the answer, but it's just fascinating to think about that. Yeah, we're getting we're we're getting closer to the answer. Like we are now, <laughs> my lab's doing some experiments where we will give will test the difference between an acute like a single acute exposure uh, right. and then a rapid death. So the, the, right now the phase that we're as we're saying, um, we know that when we we can take a particular bone and measure a drug level in it. The interesting thing and and which actually makes it more complicated is that depending <laughs> on which bone you pick you can have a huge difference. So from a section of your vertebrae to the end of your, your shin, your tibia, uh, you can have two, sometimes as much as 20 to 100 times, 100-fold difference in drug level from the right. same body. Wow. Right? And that immediately, that is not the kind of thing that you have in a, in a blood or a urine sample because this stuff is always It's all the around. same everywhere, yeah. You get little differences depending on where you take the blood from, but it's nothing like that. Right? Hmm. Now, is that is that um, and so now the bone takes in nutrients or how it grows or like what does that do to? I, I mean, I can I can't answer that definitively. I can give you my hypothesis. Sure. My hypothesis okay. is that the um, your dr drugs and this is from a the perspective of a high school teacher. Sure. If you ever teach chemistry, yeah. um, the one thing that likes that that undoes kids' heads in high school chemistry is the whole idea of equilibrium calculations. Mm -hmm. And so a drug is a perfect example, and pharmacology is a perfect example of this. You take a drug, uh, it has to cross, hypothetically, hypothetically, hypothetically. Any, and this could be a Tylenol, something, <laughs> anything. Uh, it has to cross a tissue boundary to get from outside of the body to inside of the blood to sure. be delivered to where it's going to act. Um, that's an equilibrium process, a diffusion-based process. And most of the, if you look at our bodies, most of the organs where most of the fatty tissue is, and drugs are organic molecules that tend to be mm -hmm. fairly lipophilic or fat-loving, uh, most of those organs are all inside chest cavities, lungs, liver, heart, uh, and so on. And so you get drugs that have a tendency to soak up uh, partition very heavily 
uh, on an equilib in an equilibrium basis into those tissues. And when a body, after a body dies and the decomposition process starts, the decomposition process is largely liquefaction. So everything just turns right. from solid to just juice, and then it drops. <clears throat> and so depending on the, the position that the body lays in, and we haven't done positional studies yet, but one of, this would sort of help support the point, um, we think that a lot of the drugs get into the bone just by, almost basically by absorption. It just sucks yeah. it up just like a sponge. And wow. Yeah. So I would have guessed the drugs were there from metabolism in a living organism. But what you're saying is that they, they, they're literally sponging it up as the body decomposes They go, the bo bone tissue, a lot of people don't realize this, but bone tissue is not just a, a, like a, a rock scaffold. It's, right. it's yeah. a living tissue. That's why you get bone cancer. And there's, it's, it's vascularized, which means there are small, very small um, blood vessels that run even through the thickest, densest bone in your body. Mm -hmm. You have those things there. So the drug can get there through normal blood flow, and, but it can also get there by soaking into the, um, into the blood through basically being dropped on it. Yeah. Right? Yeah. We've done a couple of short, quick experiments where we actually inject an animal post-mortem so that uh -huh. they're not getting the drug yeah. being yeah. through the blood system, and then we allow it to decompose. And if, it, if you do that, then in theory what should happen is if that, if that soaking up mechanism is one that actually works, you yeah. should see something in the yeah. bone, and yeah. we see a little bit. It's sporadic, and it's very variable, and it's not as, as sort of cut and dry as it is if the animal receives the drug. The other interesting thing is that you can get drug out of a, a bone and a blood sample, a bone marrow and a bone sample, 10 to 15 minutes after injection. So it's not like it takes a long time yeah. for the stuff to get in there. It's like the animal is in there. The animal's just starting to show the effects. If we put the animal down 10 to 15 minutes after they're injected and they started just started showing the effects, we can still see it, especially in the bone marrow. Yeah. Hmm. So. We have a forensic science program here at Laurentian too, and mm -hmm. um, a colleague of mine is an anthropologist. So he studies. He's he's a the person that goes and and if there is skeletonized remains found, he goes and identifies it human, is it male, is it female, sure. is it likely you know um, you know ethnic history at some point, and things things like that. And uh, they we tend to do wherever we can. We try to do our experiments with pigs because a pig physiologically is the closest yeah. thing to a human. So if you ever see anything on CSI about yeah. You know, doing experiments with pigs, that's where it comes from. It's because the pig torso is roughly the same shape. But he did a, he was doing an experiment. He looks at uh, traces, trying to find traces of trauma in bone tissue. And he yeah. had a student with a, a dead pig carcass take an axe and start chopping at the, <laughs> and then letting it, after it had decomposed, because this, trying to di differentiate between pre-death and post-death, so uh, perimortem, anti-mortem and post-mortem trauma. And uh, yeah, the, the, the commerce faculty in the floor above us were, were lots of uh, sick leaves. <laughs> <laughs> they weren't very happy. <laughs> well, I think I this is a probably friend. a good time as any for a quick break. So we're going to take a quick two minute break to thank our sponsors. We're talking with Dr. James Watterson at uh, Laurentian University, who's the chair of the Department of Forensic Science. We'll be right back in two minutes, everybody. Thanks for staying with us. This Week in Science and Education is brought to you by Sheridan Institute of Technology and Advanced Learning at Sheridan Students Shine Brighter. Check out sheridanc.on.ca. And we're back. Our special guest today is Dr. James Watterson, the chair of the Department of Forensic Science, Faculty of Science of Engineering at uh, Laurentian University. It's been a fascinating discussion so far. We're getting an in-depth view in terms of how research is <laughs> sometimes kind of quite humorous with these stories <laughs> that uh, we're being privy to today. And odorous. Uh, Colin, I want to... Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Let's give Colin another chance to jump in with an educational tidbit for all you teachers out there. Well, you know what? It's, I've got tons of questions, actually. One of the things, you mentioned the wolves, and it sort of made me think, okay, well, what about applications outside of, say, human forensics? What about things like toxicology with environmental applications and, you know, long-term toxicity in, in wolf populations or something like that? Like, is some of the work that you do applicable in some of those kind of areas as well? It, to me, and now this isn't an area that I've investigated very deeply yet because I'm a forensic guy, not an environmental sure. guy. But the, the basic science is the same across the board. So if you're looking at a, a large population of animals uh, that may have been exposed to an industrial toxin, for example, right. um, the thing to keep in mind is that people seem to think that it takes a really long time for a body to turn into a skeleton. Mm. Uh, in the throes of summer heat, so when we do our decomposition experiments, we inject rats, and we leave a rat outside to decompose naturally, um, in Summer heat, that is complete within, if there's lots of insect activity around, mm -hmm. uh, anywhere from one to three weeks, depending on the weather. Wow. 
So it's really? a lot faster than anybody gives it credit for. So if you have a How wild population of animals that may have been exposed to some sort of toxin, um, then they may, uh, by the time they're found, yeah. um, that may be all you have left. And right. so it could, in my view anyway, have a very significant <laughs> implication for environmental stuff. I, it's sort of semi-related, but when we talked to, to David Lesbury a couple of uh, weeks ago now, about um, some of his work in viruses and, and uh, disease in amphibian populations. One of the reasons that we've been slow to try to figure out why amphibian populations are declining globally is we have had populations disappear and they mm -hmm. decompose so quickly and so completely right. that before we know they're gone, there are no bodies to, to sample. Right? And these are organisms with very fine skeletal systems. And literally, people would go into, and these were, were warm, you know, temperate uh, or uh, tropical areas, and they would find nothing. Mm -hmm. So it's not that we even had skeletonized remains. There was just nothing gone in a really short period of time. So decomposition can be in, in incredibly fast. Yeah. Conan, you combine that with scavenging. Yeah, sure. Uh, scavenging is the other, the big, <clears throat> uh, another big thing that can play a big role, too. Mm -hmm. Dr. Watterson, uh, what are you looking for in terms of a student? You know, I'm thinking I'm a student that's interested in this as a career choice or, you know, first as a, uh, as a course of study at a Laurentian University. What kind of criteria are you looking for for students in this area? When you say students, you mean students that enter our program or students that enter my lab as researchers? Typically, I take students in my lab as researchers from the fourth year of our program. So, and normally the way that I do it, and I don't, not all professors do it, but the way that I tend to do it is I bring them in the summer before their last year, and they spend the summer working fairly intensively um, for a couple reasons. A, uh, what we were just our, just, our discussion a minute ago was about the effects of climate and the, the rate of decomposition. We need to do our decomposition experiments in the summertime. Uh, because in the wintertime, <laughs> nothing decomposes. It takes really <laughs> actually nothing in the wintertime. Like right now, it slows down to a, right, a yeah. crawl. Um, but the, uh, in terms of students incoming, like say high school students that are interested in studying forensic science uh, as an undergraduate degree, um, it's, a, it's essentially it's a science program. So it's, it's no different than chemistry or biology. We, we look for you know, advanced level math, um, chemistry, physics, biology. Uh, and obviously everybody has to take English. So um, our program is fairly... Um, one of the more strict in terms of entrance requirements, certainly at Laurentian, um, and that's, you know, we, we like it. It's nice and small. We keep it capped at 40 students uh, incoming in any given year. Um, we like it. We have a, a very close relationship with our students because we get to know them on a date, on a, a you know, face to face, really? name to name, Sorry. face to face basis. It's one of the really interesting things about the, the forensic program that James is in is it's a very small faculty, but it's a very diverse group. Yeah. So James is the forensic chemist. You've got uh, Scott's your anthropologist. Mm -hmm. Jared is. Jared is a, he's a professor emeritus, so he's retired and he teaches, he's a botanist. He's actually came to us from the Department of, of uh, Biology, but now he does consulting forensic botany work for the Office of Chief Coroner. So if they find a body, if they find any plant material, sometimes you'll see a skeleton. Um, if a body's gone to skeleton, you can actually get plant roots and things like that that grow through the skeleton. Right, so he sure. does things like, you know, determine whether or not the body may have been moved, whether it's likely it was there, how long, so on and right. so forth. And then you've got the um, criminal Tracy. law. And what's that? Criminal law. Yeah, uh, Brian, Dr. Brian Dunn, who's a, he's a, not a scientist at all, actually. He's a, a professor of jurisprudence. So he teaches four years of law. One of the nice things about our program, I think, is that our students get four years of law education. Um, so they have, they have required courses in law in each of the four years, which is nice in my opinion. It provides a nice sort of rounded yeah, education. Balance. Yeah. But it, so it's a really, it's a diverse group of faculty. It's a small group, but they all have the, the little niche that they work on. And, and the students end up with, with you know, it's a, it's a narrowly focused program, but you end up with a fairly broad base of, of courses that they come out and It's with. actually equally diverse in some sense because there are specialties within our program. So there's a forensic chemistry specialty, and those are usually the students that end up coming and working with me. We have a general stream um, where people that either have an interest in a forensic area that isn't offered as a specialty, like DNA. We don't have a DNA specialty at this time, so <coughs> people that are interested in forensic DNA analysis tend to stick in the general stream. We have an anthropology stream at the moment that is sort of in flux at the moment, uh, and a psychology stream at the moment, which is also in flux. But um, we have uh, forensic psychology faculty uh, on board, hmm. and uh, other ones. So we end up 
with the opportunity to specialize, but at the same time, the whole entire student body is fairly diverse. Right. So where would I go if I'm a student if I want to get more information on uh, your lab or the forensics program at uh, Laurentian? Uh, the website, the, the the uh, departmental website has links to my website, so uh, it's uh, forensic science at Laurentian Forensic Science uh, .ca. Okay, wonderful. And we'll put that up in um, the show notes or something. Absolutely. Put that up in the show notes at tys.vrock.ca. Thank you for that reminder. Last question today goes to Colin, and then we've got a call today, gentlemen. Well, I was just sitting here thinking, and it, it might be kind of a funny question, but um, what drugs are you working on specifically these days? Why do you uh, ask? I, I, I have the difficult balance of trying to find key. I try to do it so that it's relevant to the forensic community, so when I publish sure. my work, the people that are practicing in the area uh, have a reason to read it. Right. Um, I also actually am actively trying to choose a spectrum of drugs so that we can test different chemical properties. So some drugs sure. may be more chemically basic, some of them may be right. more chemically acidic uh, stability. So we right now, um, in terms, we, we play around with uh, Valium. Mm -hmm. Still diazepam. I should study. say study. study. Uh, it's a bad thing. Yeah. <laughs> so we're studying the effects of uh, diazepam in rats. A drug called ketamine, which has been oh, yeah. a drug of abuse. Some people have suggested it's yeah. uh, used as a date rape drug, although that's a bit tenuous. Um, uh, some antidepressants, a number of antidepressants actually, some older style and then some new ones. One uh, called citalopram, which is one of the most commonly prescribed drugs in the world right now. Hmm. Uh, and then other ones that are older drugs that some people today might not have heard of, the barbiturates. Which are, um, but they have a, a scientific value in this study. The other thing is, again, trying to keep it to drugs that are not uh, difficult to come by uh, right. in terms of administering. So it's uh, uh, it's not not as easy as it might seem to come across oh. some cocaine to administer to some rats. So I would suspect so. Yeah, <laughs> fascinating. Thank mm -hmm. you very much. Our special guest today has been Dr. James Watterson from Laurentian University. Uh, Dr. Watterson, thank you so much for taking the time to join us. It's been very educational, and we really appreciate your time. Thanks, James. Thank you. On behalf of Dr. Thomas Merritt at Laurentian University and Colin Jago from the Kawartha Pine Ridge District School Board, this is Kevin Kugler, a virtual researcher on call, saying thanks for tuning in, everybody, to another episode of This Week in Science and Education. Check out our show notes at tys.vrock.ca, and we'll see you all again same time next week. Have a safe and happy week, everybody. Take care. <laughs>